If you uh, were somehow uh, in the midst of a reptilian, what would you ask it, John? <laughs> That's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, so many years of, of searching, what would the first words be? Um, exactly. How about, I would have to reassure it that I come in peace. Do you think it would care? I don't think I would have, I don't think that I would have a chance to even realize what hit me if it did care. You know, if it decided, it, you know, it, it didn't like it. But I think that um, peace is what it's really all about. We have to live symbi in symbiosis with each other. And um, if it was coming to harm me, I would just have to take what was coming for me because, or what I was going to get because I've been looking for them for this long. Eventually, maybe one day I'll be standing toe to toe with one um at that time you know what i'll have to think deeply i, I just don't i would i think i would be speechless i don't know what else to say i'd probably be speechless do you believe that they are also involved in the alien uh, abduction phenomena uh most assuredly i know that um, we've had uh, increased numbers of reports where the grays even though they uh, appear to be somewhat of a independent species of their own there are and there are some of them that are um in in working directly for the reptilian humanoids they've been seen directing the grays around on the ship without question and so they do seem to be kind of in charge of the show as far as that's concerned during abductions but we also know that there is another cast of the reptilian humanoids known as the draco these beings have of weathery, leathery wings like that that you would perceive in a, a bat to have. Um, they would have uh, protuberances out of their, coming out of their head that are like um, horns. Uh, they're actually uh, cranial cavities that have resonance capabilities for communication. Uh, and we also uh, have heard that the Draco have been seen, uh, some of them with a bronze, dark reddish kind of a scale and others having that of a white powder, like a white powdery scale. And the white ones, uh, the albinos, as they appear to be, seem to be the elitist of all the cast of the reptilian humanoid species, groups. John, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating field. Next hour, I want to talk about your, uh, your, your work in underground uh, caverns and uh, what you've come across there. Uh, is there anything we need to be worried about? with these visitations? No. I mean, uh, you know, the horrible thing about it is this, the it's your sanctuary. When you're in your room at night, that's your sanctuary. That's an invasion regardless of who was in there. I don't care who was in there. If they're not my family or anything, that's an invasion of my sanctuary. I think that immediately hits people when they have an encounter. So, um, and I, it's hard to get over the fact that you're never really truly secure from anybody coming into your home. But as far as a group coming this way or anything that might happen, I think that we just have to watch this large game play out. Um, we are just uh, actors in the, on this large stage. It's just that um, we happen to now see that there are characters far beyond our imagination that are going to be taking a part in what's going to be happening here. It's uh, definitely almost like a classical mythological play that's getting ready to act itself out for human consciousness to witness. You know, they say that there are, you know, a, a number of different species of ETs out there, this being one of them. Um, is there a variation of the reptilians? Uh, yeah, there are, uh, like the cast uh, uh, distinctions, like I was just talking to you about, the, the Draco versus the reptilian right. humanoids. Uh, the greys are also thought to be a, a, uh, a hybrid between... Um, reptile and human, but one that was uh, perhaps created uh, to be more of a cloned race than anything else, just as something that could be given instructions like robotic instructions so it could follow out, uh, that it could follow out. Uh, I'm, I don't know how they would strip it of consciousness, but I guess biologically they may have studied consciousness long enough to know which part of what brain structure or something would be required for it and maybe take that out from these gray robot type uh, clones. But um, uh, they are considered part, partly reptilian humanity to a certain degree, but they're not like the pure grays. 
Um, others have been seen to be quite small, uh, just as if, you know, there have been the hobbits that were discovered off the islands in Java, you know, that were only two to three feet tall. You know, so have the reptiles also been seen to be rather large or be rather short. And um, that's what makes it hard to pin it down uh, with the reports because people are saying, well, I'm hearing all these different stories of different types of alien reptilians, and it's not just one kind, so I can't really believe, believe it. But the point being is that, uh, uh, as I've stated, there are as many variations in form just as there are with humans. What do you think of Ike's theories, that there are some families here that uh, are reptilian blood? Uh, I believe that we all have genetics that are leading back to the ancient reptiles. So if we want to point fingers, we have to recognize we all contain that. It's just that some of these guys that are ruling this planet are truly so separated from, from it seems like separated from the global consciousness, that we, that we perceive them as being something of of some sort of an evil character, and I guess that would be true. I wouldn't say it's yeah. as they're part of a bloodline. You know, the the only blood that was ever pulled off the Shroud of Turin proved to be Rh negative, which already has been established as Rh negatives have a higher degree of reptilian humanoid or alien contact more so than most other blood groups. This has been clearly established before. So this means that there's only a small population of this planet that have... Um, have some sort of uh, genetic different difference in their blood or something like that that the aliens seem to be following along and, and, and looking at. And from our research, the protein on the surface of the cell uh, that, that makes you Rh negative, it, it really is something that's used as a transfer for carbon in and out of the cell well, wall. It helps accelerate the exchange of carbon, which means that Rh negatives are actually um, per, uh, have been uh, born or made I'm being careful using that term, sure. uh, or hybrided, to actually be um, in better health in a highly polluted environment. John, do we know if uh, there were any ancient caves that had depictions, drawings of these reptilians on them? Uh, yeah, the, the Native American Indians have a lot of different petroglyphs that show um, the anthropomorphic shapes fusing humans with different animals. Uh, they do have those with the uh, reptiles as well. Um, there's uh, a lot of Native American mythology that points directly back to serpents and the snake people, as they called them. And, of course, the little greys, which I already pointed out, are the little um, ant people. They're seen in these, in these traditional forms and um, uh, throughout American mythology. And uh, uh, the petroglyphs are just a record of their presence here, just as the, in, in Egypt they tried to build the pyramids as a storehouse of information because it could weather the sands of time nicely, although time's changing slowly, as we've been saying. Well, they do. Times continue to change. Stay with us, John Rhodes, because up next, your legendary life. Is there a secret underground base in Dulce, New Mexico? Up next, the crypto hunter John Rhodes sheds some light on that for us on Coast to Coast AM. John Rhodes, uh, the UFO hunters with my good friend Bill Burns, uh, you recently appeared on that program talking about a suspected secret underground base in Dulce, New Mexico. Tell me a little bit about that. Did you have fun, John, doing that show? Oh, absolutely. You know, the crew's a blast. Um... And uh, the team itself is, is thorough and, and uh, really open-minded. It was uh, fun to be there with uh, uh, a cast and crew that could do such a, a good job. We had an interesting time there, learned a lot, and there were a lot of uh, new revelations that took place there. And um, uh, finally, the, the, the idea of, uh, of underground genetics laboratory where genetic research is being done as well as other types of uh, photo analysis research it's very much peaking uh, uh, the awareness now, and it's a good discussion. Tell me a little bit about uh, about what they asked you about. Uh, well, basically, I got up there with the with the guys and and showed them the actual uh, patents for this. Uh, when we talked about um, the uh, Dulce base, I showed them the floor plans of the Dulce base as described by the whistleblower Thomas Costello. Uh, who originally reported the existence of the base. He was there working, and when he decided to leave there after 
uh, a number of years of being employed there, he uh, took with him uh, objects and evidence of the base, including uh, videotape footage, photographs, and, and documents, as well as what they called a flash gun. And uh, he retreated from that area and hid those, and then he disappeared. And uh, the story of the base has gotten out over a number of years. But um, uh, in, 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 in my position there with the show, I was showing how when people go there to report having been taken on board some sort of a train or being transported at high speeds from one location to another, how we had the actual um, uh, maps and uh, documents, as I provided on your show previously, of the RAND corporations talking about super-fast maglev trains underground, and also uh, was able to provide them photographs of a, a, a subterrane being tested. This is one of the uh, tunneling machines that melts through rock, uh, because, you know, rock, even granite, uh, actually melts at about 2,012 degrees Fahrenheit. And so these tunnels have been designed using this equipment, and they looked at the floor pans of the base as described by Thomas Costello, and we kind of did a breakdown on what is supposedly going on on each level. You know, John, uh, th these underground bases have always fascinated me uh, since the beginning of time. And the question is, who knows about it? How do they know about it? How long have they been built and everything else? Why there, though? Why Dulce? Uh, well, one of the things that um, researchers in the area of underground research have found out is that uh, one of the best places that the government has secured for itself uh, for building underground bases is on American Indian land, uh, because it ha started many years ago, and only a few of the perhaps tribal elders were ever co-opted, or or they ever maybe perhaps they didn't even know about what was going on, but um, agreements were made. Uh, in some cases, and uh, uh, operations took place on those lands because if anybody came sneaking around, uh, that's tribal Indian territory. They don't have to abide by U.S. laws. They have a law of their own. You can't even get um, you can get local law enforcement because the tribes have their own law enforcement. But you are not going to get any state or federal law enforcement getting on those lands, looking around if they thought somebody reported, oh, there's an underground base in there, or. George Nori wanted to pick up his backpack and go traveling across that land. You couldn't exactly do it to, to, to see if there's any uh, you know, validity to some of these reports coming in. So they've concealed themselves very well. And um, there are several locations, uh, one of which is you know, in, the, in the Page area of Arizona and also in the Grand Canyon. And, and I believe that there's one outside the Grand Canyon Caverns. You how know, long do you, how long the place. How long have they been working on this, John? Well, at least uh, when geological exploration first took place in, in large ways, meaning petrochemical research, when they were looking for oil, they were looking underground, and they were using all kinds of the newest technologies to find cavities underground that could be containing oil. I believe at that time they were discovering more and more of these lost or abandoned or even perhaps occupied underground uh, 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 cavities inside the earth in which um, artifacts were discovered from lost mm -hmm. civilizations, um, perhaps even um, evidence of off-world cultures was discovered there, because I believe that if there are truly extraterrestrials visiting earth, which I believe to be the case, um, they would probably have some sort of a parking lot down there where they could pull in and park and everybody can get out and do their thing, maybe for three or four years before going back light years away or, you know, wait, at least spending a long trip going home. Um, and so uh, these places that have been out there, um, some of them are new. There was, during the 1950s with the Cold War with Russia, there was a large-scale uh, push to be able to build underground bunkers for the survival of our government in case of a nuclear war. The Soviets um, expanded theirs extensively, and the best country in the world is Sweden, and their underground cities that they have for most of their populations. Here in the United States, even though we're being told we're at threat level orange or this, that, and the other, and that we're expecting nuclear strike on cities at any time, I haven't seen anybody on the air actually encouraging American citizens to start doing what our parents or our grandparents were told to do, which is, hey, get together with your friends, build a small bunker in your backyard or something like that. 
they were giving us advice about civil preparedness then, but it seems to be mysteriously quiet at a time like True. now. Well, there was paranoia then, John. My gosh. Well, there was paranoia, but at the same time, it, you know, one of the ways we can pull our economy up is by reinventing America. We need to start doing something where we all can feel a good sense of national pride. We can start having new technologies emerge. Hopefully one day we would even be able to have open contact with an inner earth culture so we can establish cultural and technological exchange so we can save our planet. I don't believe that it's, it, I believe it is needless when we know that there's an extraterrestrial presence here on our planet. It's needless to, uh, uh, for us to think that, um, that they're just sitting there. I mean, I just don't believe that they're sitting back there not thinking that in some way they could participate. Uh, it might be only after disasters take place, but if we reinvent America and at least it reveals some of those technologies that have been underground by the military-industrial complex, we could do amazing things. We have the greatest artists. We have the greatest engineers. We could do remarkable things. And building those underground bases and cities is the, really the way to go. You know, I, I've said it before, the, the maglev train system sounds frightening, but it, it certainly is, you know, what our best scientific minds came up with. There's no other transportation that we've even been shown that can take us from one location like the coast to coast in 20 minutes. So, you know, we need to start employing these things, and the underground base aspect of it is just an example of exactly how great it could get. The, the Mount Weather and the Greenbrier Hotel, which we showed, which they showed on the show, was a great example of, of what was provided to our leadership. But, you know, we're way, way, way beyond that at this point. You know, and I don't have a problem with governments building underground facilities to protect the nation. Uh, you need some organization. You need some... Absolutely, uh, we do. I, I, so I don't have a problem with that. But what is the reptilian tie-in with, with these underground bases? John? Well, the, re the, re the reptilian humanoids are said to be just one of the participants of a multi-species agreement that are uh, that have culminated in the activities taking place in Dulce. And because that, you know, it, uh, I said it on the show, uh, which is an important statement for everybody to be reminded of. Remember, if these guys can't be trusted with all our money and want in with these large corporations, and we've seen what they've done with our trust, if we told them that they had to abide by civil laws saying that you can't use humans without their knowledge uh, in genetics experiments, uh, do you think they would really abide by it? Because it would no. you want to be the guy using the laboratory rat when you know some other company might have a hidden facility in which they've got some child hooked up to something, and this is going to get them, you know, 30, 40, 50 years advanced, more advanced research than their competitors? Hmm. Some We know in our hearts there's something like that going on, and that's the terrifying thing about Dulcie. It's because we, we know if it's not Dulcie, it's somewhere, and, and there are victims. Is part of the problem, John, that maybe you sense the clock is ticking and that something could happen? Oh, you mean with, like with CERN? Well, with anything. Um, whether they know an asteroid's coming, whether CERN could go awry, whether they think uh, nuclear war is imminent. Uh, I, I mean, th they're preparing for something. I mean, well, you have to I admit think, that. I think that we have to only look as far as doing our own research on computers where we have to pile, uh, start researching news articles, talking, seeing what other governments have been saying recently. And it seems to me that they, they are all expecting civil unrest. True. That being the bottom line, uh, that is enough for us to deal with. I've always been a person that says that you know the best way to avoid a war is just staying completely out of it altogether. Which means that if you have the opportunity to go get yourself a piece of land with your own well, and it's kind of within vicinity of where you feel like you are at least near civilization and transportation, but you feel like you could be off the grid and and on your own, that's pretty much I think the, the, the way to go in the future. Because if our governments are doing it now for themselves, why shouldn't we be following their fantastic example? Tell me what you think this underground uh, city looks like. Yeah, the Dulce base? Yes. Uh, Dulce base is, uh, was reported to have been of concentric ring circles of uh, large laboratories that are um, accessed through main, main uh, spoke-like corridors and also 
ring-like corridors around the entire facility. There's a central hub that uh, is thought to uh, and said to be security as well as uh, communications, and it reaches down through the entire uh, seven levels that were reported. The first level is where everybody comes into, and um, uh, these are where you know political you know brujas that come in get to say, "I get to go to the underground base." This is kind of like a general center for them. It doesn't show very much, but the second and third levels get. Uh, more and more interesting as you're going through records and computers and different types of, of, of research laboratories, photo analysis, meaning they can uh, advance the research of, of uh, uh, Krillian photography um, that had been done to see into the human aura and be able to move people back and forth out in and out of their body like an astral experience, but by doing it technologically and studying different energy effects on humans. These are what goes on those levels. When you get further down, Get all the way down to like, like the, the security and arsenal levels are like on, I think, five, four and five. And then when you get down to six, you have where you, the scientists are actually fusing humans together with animals. And they're trying to come up with super soldier um, technologies and bio enhancement, this, that, and the other. You know, most, a lot of our aviators now during, I know, the Iraq war were being uh, told they had to take certain amphetamines in order to fly the fighter jets. Otherwise, they weren't allowed to light, be on the flight line. Huh. So these are cognitive enhancers that they've been experimenting with, even with our own troops. Um, then they have been doing this kind of research using a facility like this, knowing that, hey, we can use human test subjects. And usually these are guys from prisons. These are people off the street. These are people that otherwise wouldn't be missed by mainstream society. And the declaration to Thomas Castello, who worked in security there, he was told, he was told listen, he was working on level six. Look, these are mentally ill people. There's no reverse in their condition. Um, un unbeknownst to the employees there, other scientists were giving the, the test subjects drugs so they could not communicate. So they're constantly drooling, and these poor guards were thinking, okay, these people are really gone for it. So if they're using them for these experiments, so be it. I'm just going to have to do my bit for my country until they found out that some of these people were not just taken, uh, that were not just committed to asylums. They actually popped up on radar of Thomas Costello's as being somebody that was reported missing. And so that's when he reversed course and, and uh, managed to take the documents out of, um, of this facility through one of the corridors that actually led to a natural cavern system nearby. This whole base is supposedly about 4.87 miles in, in diameter. The mace itself is a general, generally about the same size. The team did the calculations and said, yes, that could actually cover that distance. Um, when we were there, by the way, I'll give it, we actually met with tribal elders that openly declared that they know that there's an underground base in Dulce. And they had reported on three separate reports on interview, they had gotten where they talked about their own personal encounters with small beings with large black eyes on the side of the road and different uh, situations like that. I actually spoke with somebody that had a lizard man encounter on the other side of the mesa. And so, and um, uh, Gabe Valdez, the, the former sheriff of the Dulce Reservation, actually was able to uh, provide a photograph of a fetus that was taken from a cow just oh, outside wow. of Dulce. And the fetus itself, uh, if you see the show and everybody has got to tune in, it's pretty, pretty wild. I mean, it's beyond my imagination that they should show something like that. But the fetus had human characteristics as well as that of a cow. And they were showing it, and they said this is completely anomalous. So it does show that something is going on there. Um, uh, recently has been uh, postulized that it's just a large cover-up for some sort of outventing, gas venting from uh, the plowshare program. But, you know, as researchers, we've known that's always happened for a long time. This is nothing new. What's occurring there uh, is, is way far and beyond uh, a, a matter of importance because it does include – you know, transportation of human beings against the Declaration of Helsinki that was established back during the 60s where you have to have advice consent from a, a, a volunteer. And in the mid-1990s, that language was actually changed to say if the person's incapacitated, somebody else can volunteer them for them for experiment, which basically took the power away from the Hel Declaration of Helsinki. 
So, but we do have um, uh, human beings being used in, in, and operated on, and um, the, the show dem- demonstrated that there is something going on there that's worthy of more scientific investigation, and that was the, and that was the culminating note, which, and, and it, was, it was a good note to end on. John, what's the significance of uh, Professor S.A. Jordan? Who is Professor S.A. Uh, Jordan? I'm sure th- many of your listeners might remember uh, the, the April 5, 1909 article that came out in the Arizona Gazette newspaper talking about a lost city that was discovered carved into the side of the Grand Canyon. The Arizona uh, Gazette newspaper had published that report, and um, uh, when... They published it all of a sudden about two days later. The conversation fell to zero, and nobody was speaking about it at all. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution uh, has always said that they just feel like it's some sort of an April Fool's joke, but it actually occurred on April 5th. Um, in that uh, area of the Grand Canyon where this was supposedly found, um, they referred to a, a professor, D.S. S.A. Uh, S. Jordan, S.A. Jordan. And, and uh, when I was actually doing the research on this, I, I found a Jordan that worked with the Smithsonian Institution. As a matter of fact, a number of years before, he was actually asked to be the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Knowing that the, this Jordan existed, I uh, wrote to the, uh, the Smithsonian Institution and asked them if they had any record of him. They sent me back an email, a letter stating that, oh, this has something to do with the article about the Grand Canyon, and this there has been no Jordan, you know, that has been notable, that's been working for the Smithsonian Institution, when actually I knew that wasn't true. They had just reached for the nearest answer to an inquiry, uh, you know, an investigative inquiry. And um, it just turns out that this uh, David Starr Jordan uh, ends up being a uh, president of Indiana University, so we have Indiana Jordan and his discovery of the Grand Canyon, uh, the most remarkable underground uh, ex- uh, archaeological discovery in mankind that was supposedly made, and it all was right there in uh, Arizona. John, when we come back, let's talk about some of these artifacts that were apparently found in some of these caverns, and also we'll talk about the Hopis and what they meant when they mentioned the lizard or ant people. We'll be back. Well, next hour, we'll open up the phone lines with crypto hunter John Rhodes. When we come back, let's talk about some of these artifacts that might have been found in these caverns and also some other questions about lizard or ant people next on Coast to Coast AM. John, you talked about artifacts. Do we know anything specifically about what might have been found there? Uh, we do know that they found uh, mummies that were stored there, and they were found on benches. And above the benches, they had uh, two or three different levels of benches that were carved out of the wall, each one of them containing a uh, an artifact that looked like a, a gold or copper goblet um, and other artifacts such as that. And they looked to be increasingly more sophisticated as the, the tiers of the um, or the display tiers as they went up or down, so they were trying to show that there was something taking place there over a period of time. Uh, we do also know that they found tiger's eye amulets on the floor that had monstrous, monstrous type of carvings on them that were akin to those found in the, maybe the Bali Islands, and uh, those were strewn throughout the floor of the entire. Uh, underground city that they, the Smithsonian discovered there. Uh, the doorways um, of each of the rooms had uh, was arched, and there was a common ceiling to most that configured in such a way that smoke would have just drifted through some sort of a common passage out of the entire area. 